Good morning, River Church. Good morning. I'm Pastor Randy. Most of you know me, but a few of you new, fa- new faces. I'm, uh, I'm Pastor Randy. Welcome. Uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, you hopefully got a connection card when you came in, and um, if you didn't, they're available at the back, and I would like for everyone to use this. If you are, uh, if you've been here since the beginning, and you came, uh, got here as quick as you could, whatever, uh, over the last, the last 10 years of us being a church, uh, if you've been here for a while, you know, you know the routine. Fill this out and tell Pastor Billy, tell me how we can pray for you. If you are a first-time guest and you've never seen this before, well, use it. Use it to, uh, as, a, as a connection point between me and you. Uh, fill it out, but hold on to it. Don't, if you're a first-time guest, don't put it in the, uh, the offering basket. Hold on to it. And my wife, Lydia, and I would love to meet you at that back table after the service. Connection cards. Um, we got some things coming up. First of all, Pastor Billy, who's working with the kids today, he asked me to let you know that our youth, uh, our, our icon ministry, which is our middle school and high school, I uh, want you to know that, believe it or not, in uh, I think three weeks, uh, pre-registration for summer camp uh, is coming up. We're going to Camp Zephyr again this year. You guys are going to Camp Zephyr again this year. Uh, and uh, I, know that, I know that my boys will be excited about that. They have such a good time. But anyway, it fills up real quickly. So be prepared. It's like a $35 pre-registration fee, and we'll get your names in. We like wait till midnight, and then at 12.01, we get all our names in. So it's an exciting thing. But if you want to go to summer camp uh, this, this coming summer, summer 2023, Camp Zephyr, then, then Pastor Billy needs to know that. The icon ministry leaders need to know that so we can get a space for you because, again, it fills up quickly. Um, Next thing, you received an email from me this week. It was a brief video email. It's like a minute and a half long. If you didn't watch that, go ahead and watch that sometime soon. Uh, but one of the things I spoke of uh, was uh, the, the, the calendar that we have uh, for our holiday season. Um, every, every fall over the last several years, we have had a series, six to eight weeks of community night, where we come here on Wednesday nights, we have a meal, uh, we break up into table groups, uh, there's something going on for the kids. We're going to have a slightly different approach this year. It's going to be compacted into four weeks, and it's really four weeks of preparing for the holiday season. What that means is, um, on uh, November 22nd, two days before my lovely wife's birthday, uh, also two days before Thanksgiving, uh, Tuesday, the 22nd of November, we're going to come together for our annual Thanksgiving potluck dinner. It's always well attended. It's always really good food. Uh, we'll have sign-ups, and we'll have all the details uh, coming up soon. But just put that on your calendar. In fact, put all four of these Tuesday nights on your calendar. The 22nd is our Thanksgiving dinner. The 29th of November we come back again on a Tuesday night for pan dulce and the hanging of the greens. So we'll have pan dulce. That's for those of you that are not from here. That's sweet bread, basically. Not exactly, but that's what it means roughly. Uh, and uh, pan dulce, and we're going to be decorating the space. So we'll be hanging ribbons and bows and, and just, just making the place pretty for Christmas. So that's Tuesday, the 29th of November. Then the, the first Tuesday of December... We're going to come together. Uh, I'm so excited about this. That's why I'm about to laugh. Uh, we're going to come together for a tamalada, which is we, we, we're going to come together. We already have some tamales made, so we'll eat tamales that night. But you will also have the opportunity to make some tamales that night and then take them home and then steam them on your own time. Uh, so a tamalada on the first Tuesday night of December. And then the second Tuesday night of December, um, will be our final community night, and that's going to be uh, a, 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 a children, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a children's Christmas special, but like, I'm an adult, and I want to be there, and you, if you don't have kids, you're still going to want to be here. Uh, it'd be something kind of like a posada, like a baby Jesus and, and Mary and Joseph and a rea- reenactment and just a fun time, giving out candy to the kids and all of that. So, those are the four Tuesday nights, community nights for the fall. We decided to compact it into four weeks rather than six or eight weeks. 
and uh, it's really, really, uh, by, it will be really valuable to me if you'll make time for that and be here, and most of you do every year, uh, but that's what's coming up. Um, and I believe that's all that I have in the way of announcements. So if you would stand and say hi to someone around you, maybe a new face, maybe an old face, but stand and say hi to somebody around you. Would you please now join me in prayer? Would you please now join me in prayer as we uh, prepare, as we prepare to, uh, to go back into the Gospel of Matthew? Uh, this is our fifth week, our fifth week in the Gospel of Matthew. Let us pray and ask for God's mercy and grace as we study His Word. Bow with me, please. God, we have gathered here together this morning with the desire to step out of the, the noise of the world around us. Uh, not altogether bad noise, but, but noise nonetheless. We've, we've gathered together this morning to step out of the noise of the world around us that we might hear from you. As our thoughts and our, our values, our affections have been, been shaped by life over the last six or seven days, and in some ways shaped uh, poorly, we now want to hear from you that you might recalibrate our our, our, our beings, that you might recalibrate, might reset our thoughts and our affections and our values. If you would, if you would shape and mold our, our direction individually, our directions individually and corporately as a church, Lord, that's why we're here today, to hear from you. And beyond that, God, we are here today because we, many of us, are... Um, we're wounded, we're, we're hurt. We're in need of your, your healing. Um, so we, we ask you to work among us today. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here today. Of course you're welcome. You go where you please, but you're welcome here today, Holy Spirit, in the sense that we want to hear from you. We don't want to miss out on what you have. We don't want to walk away as though, as though you never spoke. We want we want to hear you and experience you and, and feel your presence. So, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here today. God, I ask that you would speak prophetically through me today. I've, I've prepared. I, I think I know what I ought to say, but it, that you perhaps have, have a, other words, words that, that aren't from me, that weren't prepared by me, words from you, God. If you would speak prophetically through me today, that's my prayer pray this in Christ's name. Amen. The Gospel of Matthew, this is week five. We're in the, chap we're in the third chapter. We'll get there in just a moment. This is a, uh, a well-known and, and deeply significant pericope, piece of, piece of Scripture story. It's, it's well-known. You've, you've read it many times. It's significant. And uh, let, us, let us 
pray that it would wash over us in a new and a fresh way today. You ever been lost? Of course you have. You ever been lost? You look like a bunch that, that maybe have been lost more, more, than, uh, more than most. Uh, you ever been lost? Like I used, to, I used to, in the 80s, the late 80s, the early 90s, I used to have the worst time finding a love field. That's an airport in the Dallas area. I, that shouldn't be that hard to find. But when I was a teenager, try, I, I, would, I, would have, I, was, I was off at college, and, and my, my beautiful wife, then my girlfriend, would come. She would fly to Dallas, and I'd go pick her up, and she'd come visit for a few days. And I had the, the worst time finding Love Field. And back then, we didn't have GPS. We didn't have smartphones. Uh, I don't know what I would have done if you would have told me that was coming. Uh, I wouldn't have believed you. But we had these things called maps. But it wasn't, a, it wasn't an app on your phone. It was actually a piece of paper. Uh, and, and sometimes, you recall, uh, and this is even true with, with the thing on your phone now. I mean, that, that, that thing doesn't work at all, always either, does it? But, but there are these moments in time when you, when you realize, um, even if you have a paper map, even if you have Google Maps or the Apple thing on your phone, uh, you, there's, there's sometimes the best approach when you're lost is what? It's just to turn around and go back to the starting point and try to do it all over again. Um, sometimes you just have to make a U-turn and return to the, 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 the starting point and just recalibrate and, 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 and start again fresh. And, and I think life is like that. Most of us that have done some living, we've experienced that in life. You lose your way and you end up lost or you end up in a dark place. And the only solution is a U-turn and to begin again on a new path, a fresh start. I mean, there's, there's nothing like a a redo, a fresh start when you're lost. So there's this super religious term that's often misunderstood and often misused and even somewhat scary to some of us, kind of a bummer because of the misunderstanding of the word. There's this super religious word, and the word is repentance. Repentance. Martin Luther, the great reformer who gave us the Protestant church, which regardless of whether you know what that is, you're part of that, uh, the, the great reformer Martin Luther, he, he wrote this document, which is now quite famous, which you've heard of probably, called the 95 Theses, and it begins with this very statement that says, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, and then I've, I've said Matthew uh, 4, 17. I'm going to preach that maybe next week. Uh, when Jesus said, repent, and, and he said, we'll see it later on today, he said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, back to what Martin Luther said. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. So what Martin Luther, hundreds of years ago, 400, 400 plus years ago, what Martin Luther was saying back then, and his his written words are recorded to this day. What he was saying then is that for all of us who are believers, who have heard Jesus call in our lives and have responded to Jesus, for, for all of us, the entirety of our lives should be a position or a posture of repentance. Now, the, the, the challenge for us is a misunderstanding of repentance. We think of repentance 
and we'll talk more about this later today, but repentance is being a bummer because we think, I've been caught, I've been outed, and now I, gotta, I have to say sorry, and nobody wants that. Nobody wants to live in this position of, 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 of feeling guilty and caught and therefore obligated to say that one is sorry. Now, the word that we're going to see today in Matthew 3, but also in Matthew 4, when Jesus says repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The word, that, the, the word that's used there, and so, so that we're talking about the same thing, the word, the English word repent, the, 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 the Greek word metaneo, it means this, so that we know what we're talking about and what we're not talking about. What Jesus, what John the Baptist calls us to when he calls us to repent is to change one's life based on a complete change of attitude and thought concerning sin and concerning righteousness. So to repent in the way that Jesus calls us is, is not, to, not to just be sorrowful. Like, have you ever been just sorry that you got caught? Maybe you're caught by your boss. Maybe you're caught by your parents. Maybe you're caught by your wife, and you're, you're like, man, I'm, I'm sorry, but you're really just sorry you got caught. You really you just feel shame. You wish that you wouldn't have gotten caught. You, you, you want to say you're sorry, and you want to just like, can we just like start all over again, but you don't necessarily have any sense of, of, of I'm going to change my life because I've, I've, got a, I've got a complete change of attitude regarding, regarding sin and regarding righteousness. It's important that we understand that repentance is God's invitation to respond to what Jesus did on the cross. Let me say that again. Repentance is actually God's, He invites us to, to respond to Jesus' call in our life. So therefore, there is no response to Jesus without repentance. Men would come to Jesus and they would try to deal with Jesus on like an equal to equal sort of term. I think you're a great teacher, but there was no repentance in their life. There is no response to Jesus without repentance. You, you can't come to Jesus like a good businessman and say, I've done the math and it seems valuable for me to follow you and therefore I'm going to do that. Without repentance, a, a change of attitude regarding sin and a change of attitude regarding righteousness, without repentance, there is no response. You're still dead in your sin. You are not a Christ follower. You cannot respond to Jesus devoid of repentance. It's important that we understand what repentance is, and now let's jump into today's passage, Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist. Remember, he was somewhat, somehow, we, got, we often call him cousin. We don't know that that's exactly correct, but he was somehow related to Jesus. Certainly, they, he and Jesus knew each other growing up to some degree. Although it seems that Jesus grew up in Galilee, and it seems that, um, that John the Baptist grew up in Judea, probably. All right. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent, metaneo, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Is he talking about a time, space, continuum sort of a thing, the kingdom of heaven has come near? Yeah, yeah. Is he also talking about like there's a person that has come near? In, 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 in Jesus Christ, that what is he saying when he says when he says that the kingdom of heaven has come near? He's really saying both. The time, the space, but also the person, the kingdom of heaven has come. He's not saying it's, it's about to. It was, he says it has come. It is here. It has come near. Repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is... Um, this is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. He's 
I'm talking about John the Baptist. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Verse 4. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. That's not as weird as it sounds to us. I mean, that was an alternative, a legit alternative sort of a, a diet back then. So it wasn't back then as weird as it is now. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to, to, uh, went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. They went out to him doing what? Confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Okay, this sort of this sort of countercultural vibe that you get from the story, it's an accurate vibe. I mean, you can you can you can embrace that. It's sort of revivalist, like like we're all doing our stuff in the town, but then there's something going on. There's a new work going on. The Lord is moving in a fresh way. That if you get that vibe, that is exactly what's going on here. Verse 7. But when he John the Baptist, when he saw many of the religious folk, many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, coming out of the city, and he said to them, harsh words, you brood of vipers. <laughs> Imagine if I stood up one day and I said that, like, like it'd be the same thing, like, like some new people, guests, like, you brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. I'm going to read that verse again because it's so crucial to what we're talking about today. Verse 8, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. The root word again is metaneo. Verse 9, and do not think you can say to yourselves, ah, we have Abraham as our father. John says, I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children from Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the, root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Let me read that again. Every, uh, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize with the water of repentance. There's that word again. But after me comes one. He speaks of Jesus. After me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. Some people say are untie, depending on how you translate that. That person, Jesus, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John the Baptist says, I baptize you with the water of repentance. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Verse 12, his winnowing fork is in hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Those aren't altogether harsh words, but they're very, very serious, weighty words. We're going to read one more paragraph from which I will not preach today. The last, these next few verses I will not really touch on today. But they go together, and I'm going to preach them next week, so I'm going to read them. Verse 13, we just read it, and then we, we won't touch these verses anymore today. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. And if you wonder why in the world was Jesus baptized by John, when, he, when John has, is, is offering the baptism of repentance, um, that's a good question. We'll deal with that next week. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John, but John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me to be baptized? Verse 15, Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. He baptized him. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At, the, um, at that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting or landing on him. 
And a voice from heaven said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Amen. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. And I, and I, I feel compelled to give thanks to Jesus this moment that he didn't consider heaven something to be grasped, but he humbled himself in obedience to the Father. And now every knee bows, every tongue confesses that, that you are Lord. Amen. Okay, there's a lot, there's a lot here. We can't cover everything, but I'm going to try and cover some of the high points today. One detail not immediately uh, apparent, but perhaps recognizable by the astute reader. About 30 years just passed by silently from chapter 2 to today's passage, chapter 3. You get that? Matthew, the writer of the, I mean, Matthew, the writer of this gospel, um, in chapter 2, we ended with Jesus as a child taken to Egypt to wait out the death of King Herod. And then, and then now we're in chapter 3, and Jesus is an adult. We have no written account in the book of Matthew regarding, uh, regarding Jesus' childhood. And we have scant details in, uh, in the other gospels, uh, but, but no record of Jesus' childhood. And, and now, a biographer could not stand to skip the formative years of, of, the, uh, of the subject. Uh, so why do the gospel writers leave out most, in Matthew's case, all of the details of Jesus' childhood? And we just don't know. But what we do know is that Matthew hastens to his point. And what is Matthew's point in writing the Gospel of Matthew? His main point, he rushes there, is the, the, the ministry of Jesus, the crucifixion of Jesus, and the resurrection of Jesus. That's Matthew's main point. So he hurries there. He wants to spend all of his capital on, on that. Okay, let's talk about John the Baptist for just a minute. Um, his title um, can obscure or hide his main purpose. His main purpose, you might think if I just asked you and you just sort of gave your automatic first answer, you might say, well, his purpose was to baptize. But that's not really, I mean, and it's in his name. I get, you know, I, I get that. But, but his, his main purpose was not to, um, to baptize a bunch of people. His main purpose was to announce the coming of Jesus, and, and most specifically to make, and we see it in this passage, to make uh, four big announcements. I think we've got them. Here are the four big announcements that we just read. The first announcement, and, and we need to preach this. We need to talk about this, how much God hates sin with a white, hot passion. He hates abuse. He hates false scales, dishonesty. He hates cheating. He hates, he hates when the, 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 the people that, that can take advantage of the people that can't just because they have the ability to take advantage. God hates sin. And so he, he, annou he announces, number one, the imminent, the inevitable, the coming judgment of God over sin because God is a just God and He hates sin. And God does ultimately bring judgment upon sin. He makes that announcement. He makes, he make, he make the, the second announcement is the coming of the more powerful one. He says, someone's coming and he's more powerful than me. I'm, I'm just the, the announcer here, uh, but, but the, the, the real deal is coming and I'm not even worthy to touch his feet. And then he makes a third announcement, and that is he calls us. He says, in light of that, in light of the fact that the kingdom of heaven is here, it's here, it's among us, he compels us, he calls us to repentance. And then the last 
announcement that he makes is this institution of baptism as a symbol, his baptism as a symbol, a, a token of repentance. In other words, um, he, the, it's not John the Baptist's actual, the, the, in fact, we don't even know, because like this is the first sort of institution of baptism. We don't know if he dunked them, if they dunked themselves, what that looked like. It's a brand new thought. But but, but the, 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 bad, the going under the water, the coming, it's, it's a token, it's a symbol, but the heart attitude, that's where the true repentance lies. So John the Baptist makes these four announcements, and let's talk briefly about some of them, the nature of repentance. Let's talk about that first. The nature of repentance. John's message in, in, uh, in verse 2 by the way, is the same as Jesus' message at the beginning of his ministry, which we're going to look at next week. Um, um, uh, here's what I'm trying to say. John's message that we're looking at today and Jesus' message are not in contrast. John is not a rival to Jesus. John the Baptist was he was, he was the messenger that came before Jesus. Uh, he was not in any way in competition. Uh, I'll remind you something that maybe you've heard before. When John the Baptist, um, later on, when he's killed um, by Herod, do you remember Jesus' response? Jesus was so emotionally shaken that he withdrew privately. He withdrew privately for a time to grieve. He went off all by himself and he got in a boat and he just went out on the water to grieve the death of his good friend, relative, John the Baptist. And, and it's really astounding to me, I'm going to unpack this for you today, it's really astounding to me how much of what Jesus or what John the Baptist says in today's passage is later said by Jesus. Um, they both call humanity to repent, repentance. So here's the first one, the first parallel. To, in today's passage, um, in, verse, in verse 2, John the Baptist's message is what? It's repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Next week's passage, maybe even two weeks from now, Matthew 4, verse 17, from that time on, this is the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, Jesus began to preach exactly the same message, the exact same message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. The nature of repentance, let's talk about that for a moment. I touched on it briefly at the beginning. The nature of repentance, most of us do not naturally like the word repentance because we have a misunderstanding. It's not, it's not, I'm sorry. That is not repentance. It's not sorry, not sorry. Glad I did it, but I'm not going to admit it. Of course, that's not repentance. Maybe it's nice to say you're sorry. Maybe your mom made you say you're sorry when you were a kid. Culturally, it's a good thing to say those words. But that in and of itself is not. It falls vastly short of repentance. Repentance is not getting caught. It's not being outed. It's not being shamed. That is not repentance. If you have a negative attitude toward the word repentance, it's because you think it's merely that. John's frustrated with those Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious folks. He's, he's, he's frustrated them in particular because they want to hang around, but they don't want to repent. And so he says this, he makes this curious statement. I think we have it next. He makes this curious statement in verse 8. Actually, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll read it for you, and then we'll get to it in a minute. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. I got ahead of myself. We'll get that in a minute. Let's talk about this. Why should a 
person repent? Why does John the Baptist call us to repent? Why does Jesus call us to repent? And the answer is in this statement, because the kingdom of heaven is near. The kingdom of heaven is near. That's the motivation. Now, you might say, well, so Pastor Randy, that was the motivation 2,000 years ago. How can that still be the motivation? What Jesus is saying, what John the Baptist is saying, what I am speaking of today as well is the inevitable coming of the kingdom of heaven. It's close, it's, it's near, it's at hand, it's about to happen, it's fast approaching. John the Baptist and Jesus, their summons, their, their, their invitation is, is, is one of urgency. And you would say, yeah, but 2,000 years has passed. That's a, long, that's a long time. And I would say, yes, but your life is very short. The calling to repentance that Jesus speaks over your, over your life right now, today, is just as urgent. Not because, not because, the, not because of the nature of, of history, but because of the nature of the frailty and the shortness of your own life. And, and John is saying, you know, right, that, that God hates sin and that God's judgment is inevitable. And, and the time is now. The, 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 the time is fast approaching. In fact, the time is here. Uh, the Apostle Paul used to say it this way. You can look it up later. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul used to say, today is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. You don't know what tomorrow holds. Shoot, you don't know what this afternoon holds. Several things could happen, and I hope, they, I hope neither of these things happen, but, but I could, I'll just put it on me, I could walk out of this door, an unrepentant man, and I could die tonight. Sure. I mean, statistically, the odds are not high that it'll happen in the next 24 hours, but it could happen, but you know what else? Even more tragic. You know what else could happen and this could happen to several of you in this room today. You could walk out of this room today, because the time is short. You could walk out of this room today, and you could say, you know what? I don't, excuse me, I don't give a crap. And the tender voice of the Lord might never visit your heart again, and that might be it for you. And John the Baptist is saying, the, the call is urgent. The time is now. The, the kingdom of heaven is fast approaching. You may not have another chance. Today is the day of salvation. Repent, for the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven, has come near. This may be your last chance. We don't know. And so John calls the people not to water baptism, yes, but no. Not, he calls them to repentance. The, the baptism is, is just a token, a, a symbol, an important one. But what he's calling them to is repentance because, again, there is no response to Jesus devoid of repentance. I'm going to go back to the start, and now I'm going to follow your way. I'm going to do a U-turn. My, my attitude towards sin and my attitude toward righteousness has changed. I'm a new man. I'm going to start again. There is no response. If you say, I responded to Jesus long ago, if, if there is no <clears throat> a response devoid of repentance is no response. You never responded to Jesus if there was no repentance. But again, the baptism, the water baptism, it is, it is a symbol, a token. We used to sing this song, oh, boy, decades ago now. We used to say, and we lift our voice to heaven or before you as a token of our love. What does that mean? What it mean is, 
Our voices aren't love. That's just a symbol, a token of the love that's in our heart. Now, why am I making a deal, big deal of this? Because some of you might come to me and say, Pastor Randy, I was baptized long ago. And I would say, that is a token, that is a symbol of a repentant heart. It's not, it, that wasn't repentance. Now, if that was a period in time for you of repentance, and you see the fruit, we're going to talk about it in a minute, the fruit of that repentance, then that symbol that token of baptism, it was a valid symbol of what was really going on in your life. But make no mistake about it, that baptism, it's, it's, <clears throat> it's of little or no value unless it actually symbolizes something that really has taken, heart, taken place in your heart. It's important because John goes on to explain, Jesus is coming and Jesus is going to... <clears throat> usher in a different baptism, a baptism of the Holy Spirit, a baptism of fire, and we'll get to that. So on the day that the Pharisees and Sadducees showed up to John's party in the desert, he, he doesn't hold back. He speaks difficult words. And he's not, he's not speaking difficult words to them um, because he's mean or because he, he uh, he's speaking these words to them. Um, not even because they're, they're, they're uh, falling back on their, on their Jewishness. You might think that. And some preachers might preach that. Like, well, they were, they were, um, you know, they were relying on, on their, on their nationality to, as, 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 as being salvific, saving them. And, and I mean, yeah, kind of, but really what's going on here is, is that they're, they're saying our affiliation with the community, that's sufficient for our salvation. And I bring that up because some of us do that. Say, like, I go to church, I must be a Christian, Sleep in a garage. I must be a car. You, you get my point. Like there, you say you're you're. I'm a, I'm I, I'm in this space, so I must be able to call myself that. Parallel statement number two. I'm going to show you three parallel statements between John the Baptist and and uh, and Jesus. Parallel statement. When he saw many Pharisees, Sadducees coming. To where he was baptized, and he said to them, You brood of vipers who warn you to flee from the coming wrath. Jesus says the same thing. Way later in Matthew 12, You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Again, Jesus' message didn't originate in, in John. The Holy Spirit is speaking prophetically speaking through them, but you see the parallels. This metaphor um, regarding the Pharisees. What's going on? John the Baptist and Jesus, is either, they're doubting the authenticity of these people's repentance. It almost seems like we shouldn't do that, right? And I'm certainly not going to come to you individually and do that. Like, I doubt the authenticity of your repentance. I'm not going to do that. But it is a message that we should read and that we should take to heart and that we should consider. <clears throat> why does he doubt? Why do they doubt the authenticity of the, the crowd at this point? And the answer is in these next passages. Because Jesus sees no sign of repentance no fruit of repentance in, the, in their lives. John the Baptist, same thing. He doesn't see any fruit of repentance. That they're going a different direction. That they're living a life in a different manner. So he calls them to genuine repentance. This is the third parallel statement that we're looking at today. It's the last one we're looking at today. In today's passage... He says, you brood of vipers, you know, you, why would you think that you're going to escape the, the, 
the impending wrath of God regarding your sin. And then he says, he says, produce fruit that shows your repentance. What he's saying is, it doesn't appear like you're still robbing the poor. You're, 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 still, you're still taking advantage of people just because you can. You're still, in the, back in that day, you're still not... You're still not taking care of your elderly parents. You're, you're still robbing and cheating and lying and, and sleeping with people that you're not married to. He says, we see no fruit of your repentance. Why would you think that you're going to escape the impending wrath of God? It's not that he's, this is, this is I mean, it doesn't sound like it, but this is probably the most loving thing he can say to them. It's a warning. It's like the truck, the truck is bearing down on you. It's about, to, it's about to hit you and bowl you over. Get out of the way. Get out of the way of the impending wrath of God. And how do we get out of the way? Repentance. Fresh start. Again, this is the third example in this one brief pericope, this third example of John the Baptist saying something that Jesus would later say. He says it in a more wordy fashion, but, 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 but look for the parallel. In Matthew 7, we'll get there, I don't know, maybe in 2023. Uh, likewise, Jesus, these are the words of Jesus. Likewise, every good tree that, uh, I'm sorry. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down, thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them, them being people that truly have repented. And then one of the, one of the hardest statements in, in the Bible Verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Let us quickly remind ourselves once again, repentance. It is a changing of one's attitude regarding sin and regarding righteousness. It's realizing my lostness and taking a U-turn and going back and saying, okay, now, Jesus, I will follow your will. I will follow your way. It's a brand new start. Now, as a result of that, what do we get? We get forgiveness. We get righteousness. We receive the Holy Spirit to empower us. But without repentance, there is no response to God. What does it mean to produce good fruit? I, I, I'm not even going to answer that for you. I'm just going to ask you to ponder that for a moment. What would it, what would it mean in your life to produce good fruit. Another question I'm just going to allow to linger here. I'm not going to really try and answer because I, you guys are really smart people. Think on this for a moment. In your own personal um, space, in your own context, like the life that you live, because you're not going out into the wilderness to follow John the Baptist, and yet John the Baptist and Jesus both are speaking to you this morning. In other words, what I mean by that is God brought you here. Some of you, you had no intention of being here. You had something else you're going to do. You know, maybe you're going to go fishing or golfing or final, I don't know, maybe the final weekend of dove season. I don't know, it's, it's coming close. You know, and so you're like, yeah, but, but the Lord brought you here. Maybe... For some of you, maybe it's sort of kind of against your will. I mean, you know, you came here, but the, the Lord brought you in a purposeful 
fashion. So here's my, in your own context, Jesus and John the Baptist are speaking to you. In your own context, your own life, what type of, of lifestyle are they cautioning you against? And what type of life are they promoting for you in this passage? When they say, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. I urge you this morning to a personal, quiet, nothing lavish or external necessary, necessarily about it. But I invite you this morning, I urge you this morning to pursue repentance in your own life. This changing of the attitude, this, this, this softening of the will, this saying, aha, yes, I've tried it on my own, now I'm going to step back, I'm going to do a U-turn, and I'm going to follow Jesus. Okay, final matter I want to talk about this morning, and then we'll be done. John tells of this Messiah, this, this Jesus who will come after him. Verse 11 I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me, let's stop there for a second, but after me does not, in the, in, the, uh, in the original language, it doesn't really mean chronologically, like he's coming at a later date, because he shows up right then. What is actually saying, the most accurate way of understanding this from the original statement, get this, this is even more startling, is he's saying someone's going to come who's going to seem lower than me, after meaning less than, meaning like I'm the rabbi and he's the disciple. I'm the teacher and he's the disciple. John the Baptist is saying someone's going to come, and then it happens. Who's going to who's who after me? Like he's going to look like lower than me because I've amassed a crowd and he hasn't. He's going to someone who's going to come after me, lower, seemingly lower than me. Who is more powerful than I? whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you. In contrast to my baptism, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. <clears throat> Again, this isn't exactly a temporal, uh, time-based statement. Rather, it would normally mean, one who's following me, my disciple, will be so great that I am I am unworthy <clears throat> of even serving him with the most meni menial of tasks, the most insignificant of tasks. See, in that day, disciples, they would, they would actually serve uh, their, their rabbi, their teacher. That was part of the deal. You'd follow him around, and you would do some of the stuff like, I'd rather not do this. Like, you can... Can't you do that on your own? Like, can't you put your robe on yourself? But, but no, you wouldn't do that. You would help. You would serve. You would follow, and part of the esteeming aspect of this is you would, you would serve them. But in that day, this is what, why John the Baptist says this specifically. In that day, even back then, dealing with the rabbi's feet, that was considered too insulting, even for the first year freshman disciple. Like, even that. Like, you didn't have to deal with the rabbi's feet, thankfully. When I went to seminary, I, I, I like, I, I, uh, I uh, TA'd, I was a teaching assistant for some of the professors, you know, and they, they were like, they all had doctorates, and I was very, you know, I had to do some things, and I'm like, can you do that yourself? Like, go look something up in the library. Like, you can go live. I would do all the things. But thankfully, I never had to wash their feet. I never had to touch their feet. And John the Baptist is saying, like, in this case, he's saying, I'm not even worthy to do that, this, this Messiah who is coming. And so what is, what is he um, speaking of? This is maybe my favorite point because I don't really like talking about the impending wrath of God. I just have to, right? But here's, here's where I really get jazzed. John the Baptist says that Jesus in his coming has brought, is bringing, has brought for us this, this purifying 
outpouring of the Spirit of God in the church age today. Like, like that's what we have access to today. Upon repentance, what Jesus does is he, he, there's this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. John says, look, I'm offering you water baptism, and that's great, and it's, it's the beginning step. It's like you repent, and I'm going to symbol, symbolize that with this water baptism. But Jesus is coming, and he's going to blow the roof off this dump. Jesus is going to come, and, and, and think of this, like we think really like, you know, really simple, like boop, boop, like baptism, you know, it's all clean and quick and tidy and the music's playing and then we all clap. You know, or maybe based on your tradition, you think the little baby with the robe that's way too long for him or her and you put a little water on there. And it's like, no, but, 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 but this is the first institution of baptism. And what we're talking about, like we don't know exactly, but what, what, what John is talking about is something way more violent than that. He's talking about like this, this watershed outpouring of an experience. And he's saying Jesus offers this spirit-breathed, overwhelming flood of repentance that everyone needs. And as a result, you will be overwhelmed, you will be blown over by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the purifying nature of the fire, symbolically, the purifying nature of Jesus' work in your life. You'll be a new man. You'll be a new woman. Otherwise, like, just keep trying. Do your best. See what happens. And the fire that purifies is not is not a negative to be avoided at all costs sort of fire. In other words, what I mean is when John says that this baptism uh, of the Holy Spirit and of fire is coming, this fire that he speaks of it doesn't destroy everything in its pathway sort of fire. It, it, it's a purifying sort of fire, a selective sort of judgment. Jesus, again, this, I guess this is our fourth parable. Jesus, again, uses this same metaphor. Matthew 13 says, that, let both grow together until the harvest. What is he talking about? Oh, let's go there. Let both grow together until the harvest. What he's talking about is true believers, people that are truly of repentance, and then and then people that 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 you know they they, they think they have some response, they've made some response toward Jesus. They're connected with the community, maybe in some way, but it's not. There's no authenticity to to, to their response to Jesus. It's devoid of repentance. And Jesus said, "Let them both grow up together." Maybe even in this room today. Let us both grow up together until the harvest. At the time, I will tell the harvesters first, collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. You get the metaphor? The picture is the story, in the story is one of a wheat farmer, and he separates out the wheat from the weeds, or you might say in, 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 a, in a different story, the wheat from the chaff. And he doesn't just torch the whole earth. He doesn't just say burn it all to the ground like a dumpster fire sort of, a, sort of an experience. No, burn the entire crop. No, he doesn't do that. He carefully separates out the wheat. Why? Because if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. Because in Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who, who are in Christ. God's judgment is no longer, His wrath is no longer upon you. For those of us who have, rep have repented, we have, we, have, we have started again. We are recipients of the righteousness of Christ. We are forgiven. There is no condemnation. He separates us out. He places us in the barn. 
the fear of judgment is no more for those who are in Christ. There is therefore now no condemnation. So what's today's application? It's that today is the day of salvation. Today is the day for you to repent. Today is the day for you to seek Jesus' gift of the Holy Spirit and fire. Let us pray. I give you a moment of silence. Either the Holy Spirit has spoken into your life now and you, you know what you need to do. Or, or tragically, perhaps that hasn't happened. But if you hear, if you hear the voice of, of the Lord in your heart today, then in silence, in your own little space, respond to that. Tell God what you feel. I give you a moment of silence right now. Let me pray a prayer now out loud that, that should represent all of our hearts. For repentance is a, is, is, is a daily act. Repentance is a heart's attitude that we should, we should foster. So let me, let me attempt to represent that in my prayer. And may this be a prayer for all of us. Oh God, we come to you today celebrating the good news of, of, of Jesus Christ. We come to you today with, 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 with hearts that, uh, that are troubled by all that we've experienced this week and hearts that have been distracted this week, hearts that have been pulled away from the, the message, the good news of Jesus. But today we return to that. Today we, we come back to that story. God, today our, our, our attitude of repentance is, is like this. We... We hate sin. We want to hate sin like you hate sin. We, in light of all that you have for us, in, all, in light of the coming kingdom of heaven, we hate sin. We want it, we want it to be, <clears throat> we want our bodies to be rid of sin. We ask that you, in accordance with that famous prayer, that you wouldn't lead us into temptation, but you would deliver us from evil. Oh, that you would deliver us from evil. God, we want you to change our attitude towards sin, and then, God, we also we want a change of attitude, a change of heart regarding righteousness. Now we want to be a people of righteousness, and we can't do that on our own. That's why we need the Holy Spirit in our lives. We, we ask that you, Holy Spirit, would move in our lives, and you would, you would clean us up. And you, would, you would root out the sin, and you would, you would make us a righteous people. God the Father, we celebrate, we celebrate the fact that you, you looked down ages ago, you looked down on sinful humanity and you decided to do something about it. You could have, I suppose, walked away and created another humanity, but you didn't. You, you determined, I will, I, will, I will send my son to pay the penalty for their sins, to reclaim them, to adopt them, to make them new again. 
cleared the highest hurdle that's ever been cleared. You, you decided, I will sacrifice my son for humanity. You did that. We celebrate that. Jesus, we, we give thanks to you today for you were obedient to the Father, to the point of death, to the point of, of the cross. You humbled yourself, became obedient, and now, as a result, according to the words of the Father, one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord. We give thanks to you, Jesus, for your, your obedience to the Father and Holy Spirit. We welcome you here today. In fact, Holy Spirit, we need you in our lives today. Regarding sin, regarding righteousness, we need the power and the presence of, of the Holy Spirit today. We invite you. You are welcome here today. We pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.